Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have a vintage Christmas stocking pattern and some vintage yarn that goes with it. And I want to talk to you about a crossroads I came to recently in my knitting life. So let's get started. This tidbit came to me from Allison on Instagram. There was this recent episode of the the UK version of Antiques Roadshow, which was filmed at a place called Wallaton Hall. Now, Wallaton Hall was built in 1588, and it is what they call a grade one listed building. So it's a building that has historical value um, to the nation at large. It was originally built in 1588 by a family called Willoughby. So in this segment of Antiques Roadshow, one of the current generation of the Willoughby family, they don't live in this uh, building anymore, um, but they have some of the items that have been passed down in their family for hundreds and hundreds of years. And one of the items or a group of items were some textiles that were 500 years old. So that was amazing enough that there's these, and they were in such good shape. So some of the items that were in this box of textiles was a coverlet or bedspread and some pillow shams that were uh, created by Queen Elizabeth I and some of her ladies in waiting. I believe they were staying at Wallaton Hall at the time, from what I'm remembering or from what I'm understanding. But one of the other items or two of the other items um, that were in this box were things that the historian who was, uh, who was talking to this member of the Willoughby family said that she didn't believe that there were any other examples from this time period of these particular things. They'd only been written about in, um, in texts or maybe you could see them in a painting or something like that. So what it was, was a very large sleeve. So this was a time period where these farthingales, I believe is what they're called, or these understructures for dresses that really ca caused them to poof out really far. Um, so they also had this for sleeves. And so there was this underlying structure that would make these sleeves puff out like that. And so they, they referenced this painting of Elizabeth I that showed her wearing these large, large uh, sleeves. And so my understanding of how clothing worked at the time was that uh, the sleeves were not sewn to the garments. They were like detachable so that you would put this sleeve support and you would attach it to the garment, you know, from the underside, and then you would slide the sleeve over the top of it and then attach it to the garment as well. So I thought that was really cool. And, you know, it's, it's something where you see a painting and you see this elaborate clothing and you don't really have any idea of how, how those items of clothing were constructed and what keeps them uh, holding their place like that and you just I had no idea so I thought that was really interesting so I'm going to leave links to the articles um, that Allison was referencing but I was able to find that particular episode of Antiques Roadshow on YouTube it's not on BBC one yet they're not showing this particular season yet but there is a YouTube channel it's not a BBC channel so who knows how long that episode will be up and the link will take you right to that section of the video uh, where they're talking about these 500 year old textiles so I uh, hope you enjoy it I found it really interesting to see how the underlying structure of this type of uh, of garment was was achieved this tidbit came to me from Nikki on Instagram. A few weeks ago, I was telling you in another tidbit segment about a, a vintage clothing exhibition 
that was going on in Scotland. It's possible that exhibition is still going on. I, I, I don't remember how long it was going to, to go on, but the items that were on exhibition came from the collection of a European couple. They're like one of the world's biggest collectors of vintage clothing. So Nikki, who sent me this tidbit, had I, my understanding is she had just been to this exhibition. She'd seen it in person and then discovered that the museum had a blog posting that talked about all of the different uh, eras of clothing that were uh, shown in the expo expo exhibition and then talked a little bit about that. So if you're like me, you're not gonna be in Scotland to see this exhibition. You can go to it vicariously by looking at this blog post and seeing all of the different uh, photographs of the different uh, clothing items from different um, years. Recently, an essay appeared in The Guardian about uh, the Joy of Knitting. It was written by a woman who I believe just learned to knit in the past couple of years. And it's kind of her observation about why knitting is so great and uh, something a little bit here and there about the personalities of people who are in the knitting world. So I've seen links to this essay show up in all of my different social media feeds. Uh, plus it's been sent directly to me in a couple of different ways. So in case it hasn't showed up in your feed, I'll leave a link down in the show notes. Now, many people have taken this essay at face value. Here is someone who is delighted with learning to knit and who is sharing their experiences with the craft and the people who do it that they have interacted with. Now, those observations included noticing that some people might be quiet or even shy until you ask them what they think about a particular knitting technique, and then they'll, uh, they'll tell you all about it. Uh, another was noticing that there can be a lot of online knitting drama. So this, of course, is just a reflection of how the world <laughs> works in general. There are a lot of people who are quiet until asked about uh, something that they're passionate about, and other people don't keep their opinions to themselves even when nobody asks them. So it's just as true in knitting as it is in any other uh, area of life. But at any rate, I'll leave a link to that essay down in the show notes There's been this ongoing discussion in my Ravelry group recently about how yarn has changed over the years, like how times have changed. And one of the topics that came up in this discussion was that vintage yarns often had the words moth proof printed on the label. And one of the comments in that discussion mentioned that the chemical used, that used to be used uh, to do this was DDT, <laughs> um, but that it had proved to be not only toxic to insects, but also to the people wearing the wool. Now, I started looking around to see if I could find out more about how yarn is moth-proofed currently, um, as well as in the past. So I found a few things, and some of you might have more information, but uh, the first thing I found was a news clipping from 1928 that mentioned that the Germans had figured out how to apply a chemical, <laughs> no mention of what that chemical was, uh, to the yarn, but that the problem was that it washed out so that it was mostly being used on things that wouldn't be washed frequently, like sweaters. Uh, then I found an ad from 1935 that talked about a display of sweaters that were knit um, that could be used as inspiration for your own knitting, and that the, the sweaters were knit with a particular yarn brand that was permanently moth proof. So it's not clear to me what chemicals were used back in the 1920s and 30s and then through the 1960s or later in order to moth, moth proof yarn. And DDT may have been used at, at some point along there and it's not clear to me when, when it started and, and when it was discontinued. Um, but there is still a desire to deter insects from eating wool. And I had this vague memory that the yarn I use for my technique videos is moth proofed. Like I remember seeing that on the label and thinking, oh, that's interesting. You don't usually see that. Uh, well, that yarn is 
first of all, they don't use DDT, like obviously, <laughs> but that yarn is from Brown Sheep Wool. Uh, so I looked up on their website, you know, to see what they say about it and, and if they mention what sort of process that they use. So Brown Sheep Company is a vertical mill. They do the entire process of creating yarn, starting from the raw wool all the way through, spinning the wool and dyeing it. It's a family owned business. And my recollection from seeing a program about them is that one of the family members is a chemist. And because their business is located out in a rural area, they wanted to find ways to make the entire business more eco-friendly because their wastewater isn't going into a sewer system. So they're looking at things like the whole dyeing process, the scouring process, the moth proofing, everything, and how to make that more eco-friendly. So it turns out they use a particular chemical in the dye bath that makes the dyeing process like a more even distribution of the dye while also moth proofing the wool and I thought they named that chemical specifically and I'll put it on the screen here so I wanted to find out more about that chemical and I found a research paper that was published in New Zealand which obviously is a huge producer of of wool one of the largest in in the world um, and this paper talks about all sorts of eco-friendly processes for treating wool. So including shrink resistance, which a lot of people will call superwash, uh, insect resistance, like moth proofing, but also uh, there are beetles that will eat wool as well, uh, flame resistance, and also photo stability. So keeping uh, light from affecting the color of, of wool over time. So some of the stuff is of interest when it's in wool carpeting because that's something that's going to be exposed constantly uh, over for, for many, many years. Um, and they talk about whether the process is applied to the, the top, so the, the combed top, uh, prior to it being spun into yarn, whether uh, whatever this process is that they might want to use, whether it's uh, applied to the top or if it's applied to the completed fabric. So I found this article to be really readable and I will leave a link to it down in the show notes. I had coffee with my friend Heather earlier this week. She accumulates yarn from all sorts of sources and a lot of times it comes to her free. Somebody in the community is, is trying to clear out uh, a bunch of yarn that, that either they're no longer interested in or maybe somebody in the family uh, died who had a lot of yarn. So she accumulates it and then if it's yarn that she doesn't want to use, then she passes it on to somebody who thinks she who she thinks uh, will want to use it. Like if there was somebody starting a, gr a crafting group for kids and they needed a uh, yarn, she would donate a bunch of the yarn. So she had come across this box that contained three skeins of yarn, a red, a green, and a cream color. And, uh, and it was vintage yarn and it was a vintage knitting pattern. And she thought that I might be interested because I do have this interest in, in vintage patterns. And in particular, I do like seeing vintage yarns because typically when you're knitting from a, a vintage or an antique pattern, you have to use a modern yarn and you can't always understand what one of these older yarns might have been. Um, you can make some assumptions, but it's not always true. And one of the yarns that you'll see often in these really old patterns going back to the late 19th century and well into the 20th century. One of those types of yarns is called Germantown. So your Germantown is like a suburb outside of Philadelphia and they were known for their woolen mills and in particular the good quality uh, wool yarn. So if, if a yarn label said Germantown on it, it, it meant something. Uh, and every company practically had a Germantown yarn. So she knew that it wasn't something that was really common now. There is a yarn company nowadays that is making 
uh, a Germantown style yarn, uh, very much like the old ones. Um, but this is a, a genuine Germantown a yarn that was produced by Brunswick sometime decades before. So she wanted uh, me to see this knitting pattern and I saw, well, it's not an original pattern, it's a photocopy. But I looked at it and I went, oh, it's a Grace Ennis pattern. And I knew who that was. This is really uncommon back in, you know, prior to say the 1980s for there to be a, a known hand knitting designer. Like everything was published by yarn companies or in books. It was really uncommon to have something that, that you associated with a particular knit designer. And Grace Ennis was known for her sock design. So mid-century men's socks were all kinds of crazy, cool designs. And I had heard about her probably in the first year or two after I learned to knit socks, like 2005, 2006. And I came across a website that was selling PDFs of all of her patterns. And according to, the, I couldn't remember when I saw this the other day, if the website was one run by her children, it was somebody associated with the family that had all of the originals of her patterns and was selling PDF. I couldn't find that website anymore, but I did find it through the Wayback Machine on the internet found out what that website was. And I see that it was the son she never had. So it was a family friend that knew her as she was getting older and knew what her story was. So I'm gonna leave a link in the show notes to that, that Wayback Machine that you can read the old website. It doesn't exist now, but it you can see what it looked like and you can look at all the, the pages and see what her designs looked like. And one of the things that Heather said is that the chart, the intarsia chart, it's a Santa face and a reindeer. And it's really hard to kind of read the chart. And the way that these instructions were presented is that the design was on the chart and then there were written instructions that just kind of told you how to approach things. But they weren't those line by line ex instructions for intarsia that you would normally see back in this era where you wouldn't get a chart at all. It would just say row three, knit this many in this color and this many in this color. And you just have to try to follow it that way and, and hope for the best that you didn't get off on the pattern because you, you wouldn't have a chart to compare it to. It, it has the Christmas stocking number four, but it also has sort of the inventory code of what this pattern was. I was able to find a vintage uh, knitting pattern site that actually has this pattern available. So you can look at the color chart. It looks like they recreated the color chart and there's some slight differences in that color chart uh, based, uh, um, based on what the written instructions are saying to do. The original instructions, every row of the chart is actually knit twice on the knit row and the purl row. You, you do those particular color changes uh, exactly the same. Um, but there are three places where the knit row and the purl row are different for very specific stitches like to do the Santa face, for example. And so the chart that you can see online now doesn't quite um, present the chart exactly the way that it was presented here. Um, but there are lots of, of Ravelry projects of this particular stocking pattern. And so you can you can kind of work out how the those particular um, squares are supposed to be worked for the pattern. What was really interesting about Grace Ennis was that she was knitting socks of her own design for her husband. He was in the military and people were just amazed at her designs and she started knitting them for other people and then started creating the patterns um, themselves. And what she wanted to do was to publish them in color. And so she started learning more about lithographic uh, printing process. You know, how could you even do that since that wasn't something that was normally done at that point. And so she did find a printer who would do, um, print out 500 copies of a pattern, but he didn't understand. He printed out 2000 instead. Um, so she had way more than she had intended to get 
but she ended up being able to sell them all. And so what she and her husband did was buy their own printing press and put it in their house. And so she took charge of the entire process. So it was her designs, she was printing them, she was distributing them. There's an article in, a, in the uh, 1955 issue of the Los Angeles Times that talked about her. She was making $200,000 a year in 1955, selling her knitting designs. Their house burned down in the early 60s, it sounds like, and she was able to save her master copies. Um, and then there were a few of the originals that, that managed to not get burned in the fire. So this family friend who was selling the PDFs had all of those masters. That's how he was able to create the PDFs. And at one point was also able to sell um, some copies of the originals, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, otherwise on eBay, uh, you might be able to find copies um, here and there, or maybe even on Etsy, some people might be selling uh, some of the vintage uh, patterns. She was a really interesting person. I was so delighted that Heather thought of me when she got hold of this yarn and thought that I might be interested because I absolutely was. Back in September, I found myself at a very weird crossroads. Uh, and it was a crossroads of milestones that I had hit sort of simultaneously. It kind of stopped me in my tracks. It took me by surprise. My reaction to all these milestones that happened at one time just kind of threw me off uh, for a little bit. And so I've been spending the past couple of months trying, trying to figure out where where I want to go uh, going forward. So what happened was that there were a couple of paths I'd been going down for a couple of years in, the, in different areas. Uh, one of them uh, was just running my YouTube channel and watching it grow and realizing in the past year, oh, I'm going to be hitting 100,000 subscribers. And when that happened, it didn't have much of, of a real effect on me. It wasn't until I actually received the, the plaque from YouTube, like there's this physical, tangible acknowledgement of this achievement that even YouTube said was, was significant, that I was like, oh. And I asked you guys if you had questions about, about YouTube or about me, and doing all of that research about just like thinking back on where I'd come in my channel and, and looking at all of the data associated with that and just kind of talking you guys through how all of this stuff works made me really start thinking about well, what do I want to do going forward? And I've done this so far, what do I want to do going forward? And just gave me some things to think about. Well, around the same time, I finished this sweater. This sweater is my, the my 1970s installment of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 18, uh, 90s to the 1990s. And from the beginning of that project, I really didn't know how far I would go in it. You know, the original idea was, oh, I'll just knit a sweater from each century, 20th century, and then I went back to the 1890s. And I wasn't really sure if I was going to do the 70s, 80s, or 90s. You know, I, it, it's, it's my project. Uh, you know, I can do what I want with it. And I just didn't know how far I would gonna, was going to go with it. I would occasionally get asked, well, what are you going to do with the sweaters when you're done? And I'm like, that, that's like, I, I don't know. Like, that's not, that's, that's not something I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about this journey, not what I'm going to do when I get to the destination. Because I didn't even know what the destination was going to be. So those two things kind of happen at the same time. And when I finished the sweater, and then I'm like, okay, well, the 1980s sweater is one that I knit in 1990. Do I even want to do a 1990 sweater? It was like, I didn't even, I didn't have a thought about what the 1990 sweater would be. And I did come up with an idea of something that I could do, but it's going to require research and thinking and experimenting and swatching and, and all that. So I wasn't like ready to get started knitting on it. So that happens a lot at the end of a project, like, oh, what am I going to do now? And usually what I do is I open up my, the bin in my desk 
that contains all the works in progress that I have going on that I might have, you know, wandered off earlier in a year or two years ago or whatever. And I could go through one of those um, things and I would have something that was already started that I could just knit. And I looked in the bin and there was nothing in there. Because one of the other things I've been doing for the past few years, since I started um, Casual Fridays in 2018, was I started doing Finish It February. I had spent 2016 finishing a ton of, I had like 45 UFOs that I discovered in my office, unfinished objects. And I was like, oh my God, that's overwhelming. And so I just spent a, a lot of that year just getting through as many as I could. It was a lot of fun. And I thought, okay, starting in 2018, I'll just do that once a year. I'll go look and see what there is because I'm out of sight, out of mind. I forget about things. And, and it will be a time where it just annually I'll address the UFOs. The goal is never to get rid of the UFO pile. It was just to be reminded of what was there and to address those things. So I opened that bin and there was nothing in there. I, 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 I had nothing to knit and I didn't, it really didn't know what, <laughs> what to do. And then the other thing that was going on was we were getting ready to go on our trip to Europe to visit our daughter. So it, it, we'd, I'd been on this, uh, we're not traveling during the pandemic uh, path for two and a half, almost three years. We hadn't been able to go visit her in the Netherlands. She had come last fall, so we, we'd gotten to see her, but we hadn't, we hadn't gotten to uh, visit her. And so we were planning this trip. And I was also knowing that I was going to be gone for a couple of weeks and jet lagged afterwards. I was doing a lot of um, pre-travel uh, recording so that I could still publish videos while we were gone. I wouldn't just have like three weeks of nothing. So there were a couple of weeks where I, sk I skipped a casual Friday and I skipped a technique Tuesday, but I didn't want to skip a ton of it. So I was very busy um, working on that. And then while we were gone, so while we were gone, I, I just was thinking about, well, what do I want to do going forward? What are some things that I haven't done because I was constantly uh, working on like this long-term project or other little projects, knitting projects that um, that would come along, either um, socks or um, I designed, I think, three other sweaters during this time. I've been working on the long-term project, one, one for my daughter and then two for me, designed and knit them. So I'm always, you know, constantly doing those kinds of things. And I was just kind of stunned that I didn't know what to do next. And I think it really does or did have to do with all of these things happening at one time. I didn't have the momentum of any of these other journeys that I was on carrying me uh, forward while I, you know, thought through what to do in one of the other ones. What I have been thinking about in the past couple of years are the projects that are related to knitting but aren't knitting projects. So tutorials, um, written tutorials or, or long form video tutorials, more like some sort of a class. I talked a little bit last week about doing a beginner series and I've been thinking about that for a couple of years and I was kind of hesitant to do it because I felt like, well, my existing uh, viewers aren't going to be interested in that. It turns out they actually are. I was very surprised by that. So I'm, I'm always asking my viewers if they have suggestions for things and and I tend to do the things that are interesting to me rather than trying to please somebody else while doing something that I don't like. So I always have to be enthusiastic about what I'm um, going to do but sometimes I either assume that my viewers aren't going to want something or I'm not, or I I have no idea of how much they do want something. It just becomes unexpected. So a couple of years ago, I did this August sock knit along uh, tutorial on custom fit cuff, um, cuff down socks. And I thought, oh, this could be a fun thing to do for people in the summer when, you know, people aren't knitting as much. I'm knitting socks anyway, and I get a lot of sock questions. I already have a lot of sock videos. Maybe this would be a fun thing to do. And it turned out to be a huge thing unexpectedly. Like I didn't realize 
that kind of response that I that I got. Uh, and I knew that if I did something like that again in the future, I couldn't just do it on a whim like I did last time. It would have to be something that I planned ahead of time. And based on how much the, the channel has grown in the years since I did that knit along, I'm not even sure how I would, how I would do a knit along. Like I couldn't do it alone. It would take other people. And I just don't know how I would go about doing that. Uh, but I do want to do some other tutorials. So I'm thinking about things like um, just changing the format of how I'm doing videos to be more of like a contained class type of thing. So rather than there being a technique video on some separate aspect of knitting, that it would be uh, a group of videos that might be released that were all related to each other in some sort of a, a class form. So, so these are just the things that I'm thinking about. And I'm also thinking about the, the frustrations and the struggles that I have had with, uh, with my video schedule or keeping track of the ideas that I have, like in the different places, like finding a way to bring them all together. And that's something that I just found in the past couple of weeks some some tools that I can use that that uh, will help me do that that I'm exploring. So I just kind of wanted to let you guys know what was going on. You're probably not going to be see be seeing uh, knitting projects that I'm currently working on at least in the short term. I'm still going to be talking about knitting, showing you particularly things that have to do with knitting history. I will continue to be doing that and the tidbits and stuff. But for personal knitting projects, I just don't know uh, what that's going to be like in the short term. I've been doing. Uh, a fair amount of knitting recently, but a lot of it has to do with technique videos or um, that I'm going to be that I'm planning for um, in the future. So that's the kind of thing that's exciting me right now. But I just wanted to let you guys know I had this need to kind of evolve and change and grow and do things in different ways in order to keep my own motivation and keep my own interest. But I'm absolutely interested in knowing more about the kinds of things that you guys would like to see. I know I ask you that every week, but I think what I need to do is share my ideas more and then get feedback on some of those ideas to see what kind of response. Because again, I'm going to be doing the things that are interesting to me, but I, uh, but I need to do the things that are interesting to me that I can see that you are enthusiastic about as well because I do sometimes hold myself back uh, thinking oh people aren't going to want that. If you have thoughts about what would make you a better knitter and how you think that I might be able to help you either through tutorials or specific types of videos I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. But that's it for this week's Casual Friday. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.